Welcome to another of our discussions on the book of Isaiah. Today we'll be discussing chapters 40 and 41. Joining me today are my colleagues from religious education. Jeff Chadwick from the Department of uh, Church Scripture and Doctrine. Ray Huntington from the Department of Ancient Scripture. Ann Madsen from the Department of Ancient Scripture. And I'm Paul Hoskison, also from the Department of Ancient Scripture. In our previous sessions, we talked about the chapters 36 through 39 that provide a little bit of an historical interlude between sections of Isaiah. With chapter 40 now, we return to some of Isaiah's themes. These themes are going to be different than the ones that we had experienced earlier in chapters 1 through 35. But nevertheless, they form this wonderful unit, and we'll talk about that as we get into our session today. But first, let's go to verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Uh, the, the verb here, the, the pronoun in English, ye, is plural, and, and uh, it's got to be referring to the, the, somebody in Israel. Yeah, in, in uh, Paul, in, um, in the Hebrew text as well, Nachamu, it's, it's actually a command form in the plural. I want you all to comfort my people, saith your God. Who's he talking to then here? Who's mm -hmm. supposed to comfort the house of Israel? I think it's Israel world. itself, particularly the prophets of Israel. The, the prophets of Israel, well, yeah. the and leaders I, of Israel. I think verse 3 gives us a hint in terms of who it ought to be, and that is those who come to prepare the way of the Lord. Thank you. Uh, be it Hezekiah or Isaiah or even in our time, Joseph Smith. But you know, before we move on, I, 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 I want to mention something about chapter 40 that please, I think our viewers uh, might find interesting. I mean, Isaiah is such an, an important book in our, in our literature that, uh, yes. We're all familiar with Handel's uh, Messiah. Uh, the, the scriptural passages that were uh, set to music by Messiah were actually uh, selected by Charles Jennings uh, in the 18th century. He, he chose heavily from the book of Isaiah and Psalms in the Old Testament. Um, obviously, uh, Isaiah 53 uh, on Christ is, is used widely in uh, the Messiah. But in chapter 40, you have as many references in this chapter as you do in chapter 53. Uh, he chose heavily from this chapter as well. In fact, I can give you the verses here. Isaiah 40, 1 through 3, uh, comfort ye. And that is the opening of Handel's Messiah, this verse right here. So Handel's Messiah begins it by be quoting it, uh, it, Isaiah uh, chapter 40. Chapter 40, verse 1, comfort ye. We're all familiar with that. He also uses Isaiah 40, verse 4, every valley shall be exalted. We're familiar with that one. You he, can hear the music when you yes. say the words. <laughs> yes. Are you going to sing it for us? I'm not. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Isaiah 40, verse 5, and the glory of the Lord. We can hear that one reverberating in our minds as well. Also, uh, uh, Isaiah 40, verse 9, O thou that tellest good tidings to Zion, is used uh, in the oratorio. And also, Isaiah, verse four, Isaiah 40, verse 11, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. So those are all used in, in Messiah. That's very interesting and yeah. wonderful. These are beautiful imageries that, they are. that, uh, yeah. that, that Gorgeous would have inspired music. any composer. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. What was the message, though, that, uh, that the prophets were to comfort the people of Israel with back in verse 1 and 2? And I would suggest that, uh, that the Lord gives them the message. He doesn't say, go give a message without giving the message yeah. the prophets should give us. And in verse 2, uh, the prophets, are to, Isaiah and his fellows, are to say to, uh, to Israel, uh, and Jerusalem specifically, uh, that her warfare is accomplished and her iniquity is pardoned. In other words, the attacks of the Assyrians upon Jerusalem will now cease, for she is received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Is it, excuse me, is this dualistic? Are we talking about his time? Are we talking about a millennial uh, Jerusalem? I, I think it has to be it, partly both. I, I, but, I think but particularly, so too. I think it's talking about events in the latter days, long beyond uh, Isaiah's day, when other prophets will also come and comfort, and Jerusalem. comfort Jerusalem. They will also comfort, as Isaiah had comforted uh, Jerusalem in his day. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and she has paid for the sins that she's committed. And actually, as Isaiah says here, has paid double 
the normal amount, and, and there must be a reason why the Lord says double the amount for her sins. Again, I had no idea. Well, I, I, every time I read that, every time I see double in the Old Testament, I think of the, uh, the birthright son, the birthright people, um, who receive double in inheritance. So if you get double for your sins, I'm wondering if it isn't people who are covenant people who have broken a covenant and now they paid completely for their sins. Where much is given, much is expected. Yeah, yeah. yeah that much kind of thing. So. Where much is required if I, the I, expectation I like doesn't occur. Yeah, absolutely. Right, I think it's kind of a, a little signal for you when you see the double there and you're saying, Double what? Not, yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it leads right into the next message yes. that starts in verse 3. Yes. In verse, uh, verses 3 through 8 form a little uh, passage, a little a unique passage. And uh, verse 3 figures very prominently in uh, many of our other scriptures. Mm. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, use that as a reference to John the Baptist's appearance yes. uh, before the time that he baptizes the Savior. Yes, and, and they reference Isaiah. They don't just sort of say it. They, they, they say, say Isaiah said, said this. Yes. You know, I, Isaiah may also be using a, a type of imagery that was um, prevalent in his time in the ancient Near East when um, a king was going to, to go out and visit uh, places within his kingdom, he would also say, he would send out forerunners, individuals that would go out and uh, clear the path. If he's going to be moving on this road, they would ensure that, uh, that the road was free of stones and uh, roadblocks and, uh, and, and make his journey comfortable. Prepare a royal way e e exactly. for the coming of the king. In, exactly. this case, in this case, the Messiah, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is all in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. And, and by the way, the, as you mentioned there, Ray, the, the word straight in Hebrew can mean not just make it not crooked, but it yeah. also can mean make it a clear path. Yes. Yes. Clear yeah. the way, as you yeah. said. And, and that was one of the main missions of John the Baptist, was to, was to clear that path for the Savior yeah. at his first coming which then leads into probably the next thought. This is, may be also referring to his second coming, that before his second coming, there will be people sent ahead in the wilderness to prepare the Lord's way. Yes. Well, it reminds you of when we were back in chapter 35 and verse 8, when it talks about that highway that's going to be raised up and that only, it's a way of holiness, it's called. Yes. Only the righteous will be on it, and there is no better way to prepare for the coming of the Lord than to gather the righteous together so that they're all being righteous together. It's like the iron rod, like the, you know, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That I, I love chapter 35 and that little highway at the end of that chapter. I'm glad you mentioned chapter 35 because I think Isaiah is tying together his works uh, after that little historical interlude between 35 and 40, mm -hmm. yeah. he's, he's tying the works together again by mentioning this highway in the desert here at the beginning of chapter 40, which is one of the main subjects of chapter 35. Yeah, right at the end of good. chapter 35, right. appearing again here right at the beginning of chapter 40. Yes. yes. Without yes. that historical interlude, chapter 36 through 39, we'd see how seamless chapter 35 is thematically linked to chapter 40. Exactly, yes. You know, I just wanted to point one other thing out about those who are crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That, of course, is the prophets. It's also those whom the prophet sends. Mm. And all over the world today, in virtually every nation, there are empowered servants of the Lord, some of them as young as 19 years of age, <laughs> who are crying in those wildernesses around our globe, prepare the way of the Lord, and make straight in the desert the highway. And the next verse, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. That sounds like a second coming mm. kind of scripture, but on the other hand, the glory of the Lord being revealed could be those young 19 year olds standing and saying or sitting and looking in someone's eyes and saying, they saw a pillar of light exactly mm. over his head you know, and later, and the glory, the, what does it say? And the glory defy all description. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're describing the glory of the Lord as revealed to a prophet in and, our time. And how many people have been comforted 
Yeah, by because that, that, knowledge. By that yeah. knowledge. That wonderful message. Yeah, yeah. Such yeah. that's a comfort to yeah. people. Yes. Very good. I, th I think the world will see the Lord come in His glory. He's promised this so many places, including during His mortal life. And what Joseph Smith saw, the world is scheduled to, to see, see and that's know that He was a witness. Yeah. Yes. And this section continues with talking about the transitory nature of mortality. The grass, grass withers, the flower withers, and so on and forth. All of these things fade away. All the worldly cares, all the things of this world fade away. But at the end of verse 8, the word of our God shall stand forever. The word that is being cried in the wilderness, prepare the way, that word will stand forever. You know, it's interesting, this passage here, all flesh is grass, says Isaiah in verse 6. It's interesting because the voice uh, telling the prophet what to say, what do you say? Well, the message I want you to say, prophet, is all flesh is grass. <laughs> you don't live forever in mortality. Mortality means we're born to die. Your goodliness, that is your handsome good looks, if you're a young man or a young woman, are going to fade. It's like the flower of the field that blooms today and tomorrow is gone. Verse 7, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth. Mm -hmm. But, verse 8, the word of our God shall stand forever. And what is that word? That even though we're born to die, we're mm -hmm. born to rise again and live eternally. That's the word of the Lord that empowers our spirits. Exactly. And that idea, I think, is brought out in the next section, verses 9 through 11. That is, O Zion, that bringest good tidings. Mm. This is the word that he's going to use, Isaiah, later on in uh, chapter 53 about good tidings. And in chapter 61. And in 61, yes. And it's the word, the, this is going to be quoted in the New Testament, right? Right. Yes. In, in, Jesus himself will yeah. quote these, these statements about good tidings, particularly Isaiah 61, when he goes to Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. Yes. And the word tidings here, good tidings, uh, will probably come into the New Testament and in English, uh, uh, one of the possible meanings here is the gospel, the good word. The good news. The good the preaching. Good yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, another thought here too, uh, who's he talking to in verse 9? Well, it's to Zion, I think his covenant people um, that have the responsibility to take the gospel message, the good tidings to the world. How do we sharpen that message? Well, he gives us counsel to get thee up into the high mountain. Is he talking about temple here? Mm. Is this temple imagery? Yes. I it, think it, it is. It, it's the temple imagery of the restoration. Yes. yes. Yeah. And, and how and about how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet? Well, Isaiah, of course, is a multiple-use prophet. Many of his prophecies, if not all, have an application in his own time and then in other times, including our time. Especially Clearly in verse our 9, time. His immediate audience is the people of Jerusalem. They should bring the good tidings that the Lord has rescued them and now Judah and Jerusalem is saved to play the role in history that the Lord wants for them. Um, but eventually, and in our day, that message is extended to us. Zion, bring the good tidings and tell people around the world, even though we're not of the cities of Judah, behold your God. Yes, but we are Zion. But we are Zion. And that's why this passage fits us as very well today as it yes. did the Jews that had been saved in Jerusalem in 701. And the reason we can do that is in verse 10, because the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. The Lord will bring a restoration, both of Judah physically and spiritually, but particularly right. through... Uh, through Zion, through the latter days latter and day. the restoration. Yeah. The latter day gathering this and this gathering great theme. missionary yeah. work. This and the gathering. and I, I love the juxtaposing that, that Lord who comes with his strong arm with verse 11. Yes. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. Is this a foreshadowing of Christ mm. who oh. saw himself as the good shepherd and spoke of himself as the good shepherd? and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Isn't it? You know, Anne, I, I think that is so beautiful, because you remember on a session we had that, uh, I think you were there, were you, Paul? Uh, w one of the titles of Christ is the waters of Shaloah mm, that yes. go softly. 
Yes. And, and here he's going to gently lead this kind and compassionate and merciful Redeemer. And isn't that how he treats us today? Yes. Absolutely. So Just gentle. These yes. are the aspects of deity. These are the aspects of our Father in heaven and his Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, that the prophets constantly point us to. I think in the end of verse 9, when Zion and Jerusalem are to lift up their voices and say to their constituents, Behold your God, that this is not a mere metaphor. No. Not just behold the doings of your God, but God is real. In the right, uh, in the right setting, he can be beheld. And that's the message that we have today that Jesus did not only exist anciently as the shepherd of Israel, but Jesus is actively involved in the world today and reveals himself through prophets and apostles. We even have a theology that's so different from any of our friends in Judeo-Christianity that if you were given that gift, you could behold your God. Joseph Smith saw him. Yes. One day we shall all have that privilege. Yeah, just as Job looked and waited and waited till he could see him. And, well, and with that introduction to the restoration in the latter days in verses 9 through 11, we now get a discussion of God in his glory in uh, verses 12 through 17 here in Isaiah. And, and I love here again how he's spoken of so anthropomorphically, yes. meaning how he is spoken of as having body parts and attributes that are like an exalted man. Yes. Uh, verse 12 there, the, the Hebrew, I think, is so beautiful. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? That means who has measured the water in, in, in his cupped palm in there? Mm -hmm. All the water of creation, metaphorically, as if it were in the control of God in the hollow of his hand. <laughs> yeah. A phrase, by the way, yeah. that we've come to love musically in our own day. Yeah. Yes. yes. I love the next part where he says he comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountain. In other words, God knows everything. Yeah. If he can comprehend the dust and count it and measure the mountains. And um, not only this planet, Ray, the, the line that before he that, he's, he's meted out heaven with the span. That's right. He measured the whole universe <laughs> with the length between his thumb and his little finger. Yeah, it's that's wonderful. The now, that's metaphoric, of course, yeah, and true, but it's real. God was the designer of the universe. Yeah. yeah. He measured it, and he created it. And in verse 13, the talking of his omniscience, who is there that could have counseled him <laughs> and taught him? <laughs> who... There are some people that think that they can <laughs> teach God and counsel Him. Yes. A lot of talking heads to, around counseling yeah, these days. They need to come back and read Isaiah 13. Here. Uh, unlike the kings in Isaiah's day who did take counsel from their counselors yeah. mm -hmm. and from their wise men, the Lord, he, it's, he has it all. He doesn't need to take counsel. Yes. And going on there, uh, the rest of the world counts for very little. Even in, in verse 16, we have a reference here to sacrificing. Uh, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn. That is, if you took all those magnificent trees all of the Lebanon trees. and piled them up and made the biggest bonfire the world has ever seen. It wouldn't be a big enough, enough sacrificial fire. It, it would not give him the glory that he deserves. Nor yes. the beasts thereof sufficient for the burnt offering. If you yes. took all the trees of Lebanon and all of the animals as a, as a, a sacrifice on, the, on that big fire, it could never really do the Lord his due, which I suppose is, is what many of the prophets said too. The sacrifice is not really the end of the law of Moses, no. not really the goal of it. No, I, I think that he may also be saying, and I, and I agree with that, uh, Jeff, uh, he, he may also be saying here too is that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that you can do to make an atonement. Hmm. Yes. That's something I do. And, and only, only I can do that. Only he can do that. Yeah. Well, and it sums up very nicely as you begin that next section in 18, to whom then will you liken God? Yeah. Yeah. And the answer, of course, metaphorically, is not, nothing. No one. There's nothing no. we can do. <laughs> yeah. And, and we have this next section, 18, there through a 27. And there's a <clears throat> nice little parallel there. The, um, one of the essences of Hebrew uh, poetry is parallelism. And verse 18 now parallels over there, verse 25. Verse 18, to whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare with him? 
And of course the answer is there isn't any. Right. Well, God's going to ask the same question himself in verse 25. And it's actually his answer too. And yes. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? And of course, no. there is none. There is yeah. none. But nevertheless, in verses 19 and 20, some people try and make <laughs> graven images out of uh, expensive materials. And they try to, uh, uh, even the poor person tries to make a, out, of a, out of a piece of wood a nice image. And what does it count? Nothing. Um, because uh, the parallel to 19 and 20 is over in 26 and 27. Lift up your eyes on high and behold who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number. God is the one who created the gold. He's the one who made the silver. He's the one who caused the tree to grow. And you think you're going to make an, a, a God out of those things that, that he created? He, you know, not only that, Paul, it's not only as he created them, but he calls them all by names. Yes. Yes. He, yeah. He, he knows all of his creation. What was the psalmist? He said, there's not even a sparrow that drops in the sky that yeah, he doesn't and he, comprehend. And he names all the stars. He knows the stars all yeah. by name. Yes. Let me bring this together for just a moment if I could because the message we started out with in Isaiah 41 was, Isaiah 40 verse 1, was that, that we were supposed to speak this message of comfort to ancient Israel that had been decimated by the time Jerusalem was spared and, and to all of, of scattered Israel too. And as you get now into 27, verse 27 of chapter 40, the Lord is asking uh, Jacob and Israel, why are you so uh, negative? Why are you so despondent? Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O, o Israel, my way is hid from the Lord? My judgment is passed over. He from doesn't my notice God. me. He doesn't know I exist. Is sort exactly. of what yeah. you're saying. Why, 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 why does Jacob say God has forsaken me? Essentially, yes. which yes. will be a theme of chapters 41, 42, 43, and, and then God answers in 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. That means no one can ever really fathom all of his knowledge and understanding. How, how no. do you plumb the depths yeah. of God? Israel, yeah. don't you remember that God doesn't get weary yes. of watching after you? So and in, 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 go ahead. I was just going to say, and as it goes on, this powerful God that we've had described in many, many metaphors up to this moment, he giveth power to the faint. Now, the other gods that people worshipped around them didn't do this. They were war gods. They were gods of... Uh, no, they of were other demanding. Things. Yeah, yes. they wanted things. But he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength, even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall receive their strength. Let's stop for a minute and look at your footnote there to wait down at the bottom because it also uh, means uh, to hope, hope for or anticipate. anticipate. Yes. Those who anticipate or, or hope upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Yeah, faith renews your strength. And yes. there's also and the, the sense here that that is attending upon the Lord. That yes. is doing yes. the things that he has asked us to do. And if you do that. Then you shall walk. <laughs> Well, they shall walk. mount up with wings as eagles, which must have been one of the most powerful winged creatures Isaiah could bring what to mind. What a metaphor. You yes. shall ascend as a flying eagle. You'll yeah. soar. They yes. shall run and, and not be yeah. weary. They shall walk and not faint. And the whole notion that, that this is the kind of strength you have once you recognize the greatness that he's tried to explain to us about himself, the bigness, the... Yes. The wonder of God, the glory of God. And of course, the cross-reference to section 89 of the Doctrine and Covenants there, that if we will do even the simplest things, such as obey those rules the Lord has given us in the latter days regarding diet, health, and other things, we can run and not be weary and walk and not be faint. Yes. Great Isaianic uh, imagery, even in the right. Doctrine and Covenants. Yes. Now, we've spent a lot of time on chapter 40. We only have a few seconds for 41. We rather anticipated that as we began this discussion. And there's a few uh, verses here in chapter 41 that we did want to bring out. For instance, uh, verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee, be ye not dismayed. This is the source of one of our wonderful hymns that we have in our LDS hymn book. In verse 14, Fear not, thou worm Jacob. 
uh, and ye men of Israel. This is where we begin getting the imagery of Jacob being chosen as the servant, that is Israel being chosen as a servant, like it mentions in verse 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. The, the Hebrew here for my friend really means the one who loves me. Mm. That is, mm -hmm. the seed of Abraham have been chosen because they are supposed to love me. Uh, going on uh, with 15, verse 15, Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument. This is referring to what the Lord will do in the latter days yeah. with the house of Israel and, and, and the rest of the world. And in verse 20, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. It's God who's done all of these mighty works yes. of, of saving and redeeming Israel, of saving and redeeming the, the world, of gathering Israel again in the latter days and of bringing the restoration. And Isaiah is well aware that, that the Lord is going to do these things and it's the Lord's hand that accomplishes them. And we are privileged, hopefully, to play a minor role in that, in that great event of the last day. It's been good to be with you. I want to thank you and uh, appreciate your comments and, uh, and your knowledge. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.